afternoon. How's everyone? Did you have a good trip in? Okay, I saw lots of great pictures on the In Talent stream. Lots of people excited to be here. And welcome to our session, the 1 p.m. Uh, startup recruiting function, organizing the chaos. My name is Jennifer McClure, and I'm the president of Unbridled Talent LLC, which is my own company. I do speaking training workshops, and I work with companies on their talent acquisition and leadership development strategies. But I'm here today to actually introduce you to these guys so that you can learn from them and what they're doing in terms of building their businesses and um, really all the activity in regards to talent acquisition. So I'll go ahead and start with you, Kat. Actually, let me switch the slide. That's who I am. Uh, but let's go ahead and listen to Kat. Tell us about you and what your company does. Hi, I'm Kat, and I head up HR and recruiting at um, a five-year-old startup in New York City. Um, we largely focus on how you measure and monetize attention on the internet, which I promise is interesting. Um, many large publishers and content producers use our products to um, better understand their audiences and how they build loyalty over time. And um, post Series B in April of 2012, Chartbeat was a little over 10 people. We are now about 80 people um, going into Series C this fall and um, looking to double in size next year. So along with that comes its own set of fun challenges and interesting problems to solve for. I hope that you walk away from this panel with one or two things that you can take back to your own companies. Um, you hopefully learn from me, maybe. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kat. How about you, Jim, or excuse me, Anthony, oh, sorry, that's next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Anthony Klein. I head up recruitment at AppDirect, a 200-person startup just down the street here, so I didn't have to travel quite as far as the rest of you. I've been recruiting for about five years for early to mid-stage venture-backed startups. Started out in agency life, which I'm sure most of you have. I uh, cut my teeth there and then moved into AppDirect in 2012 when we were about 40 people. Uh, we've doubled every year for the last two years. Uh, we've actually doubled already this year, so we're looking to exceed our goals. Uh, my team is here with me today, so I can't take credit for everyone uh, that we've hired, but uh, looking forward to telling you guys a little bit about how we've prioritized and, and introduced new strategies to help us grow. All right, how about you now, Jim? Excellent, so <laughs> I, I actually am Jim. Um, so, uh, wow, let's see, I've been doing recruiting now for quite some time. I am uh, currently the Director of Talent Acquisition for a company called FireEye. Um, when I got to FireEye a little over three years ago, we were just shy of 100 people. Um, as of today, we're north of 2,700. So we've been fairly busy um, hiring quite a few people, and uh, hopefully I can teach you guys some of that today about how we did it and some of the landmines we sidestepped along the way. Uh, let's see, about FireEye. People ask me about FireEye all the time. What does FireEye do? And uh, I can give the complex techie answer, or I can give the real simple answer. Um, there's a lot of real bad people out there trying to steal everything on your phone and your network, across the enterprise, you name it. And uh, they're real smart. And so we've taken decades old technology that just didn't work, doesn't stop the bad guys. Uh, we've reimagined the security industry, turned it upside down, and have come up with a way to uh, unify your, uh, I guess you say your security defenses and prevent these guys or gals from uh, stealing your personal data and or your company's data. So stopping bad guys every day. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. Well, thanks for all that. And again, the, the, the uh, way this session is going to go is I'm going to pose a question to each of these guys so they can share a little bit about what they've done over the last few years as they've been building businesses and acquiring talent. And then we're going to make sure that we leave 10 to 15 minutes on the back end for you to pose questions to them. So as they're talking, if you have a question, be sure to make a note of it. And then we'll have a microphone right here in the middle, and we'd love to hear from you at the end. So the first question, I'll start with you, Anthony. Maybe if you could share with us kind of your biggest challenge as you've built a scalable recruiting function and as your business has grown. Yeah, I think a couple things, uh, but the top three really sort of being prioritization, uh, time management, and then also resources. Uh, working with a small team of hiring managers who are very much player coaches and acting in the same role as yourself, being able to act as an individual contributor, recruiter, but then also growing a team is really the biggest challenge when it comes to time management. So coming in, uh, identifying priorities, introducing a scalable framework that allows you to put more on the hiring manager and the interview team to free yourself up to go out and actually attract people inwards, uh, but also bringing up more passive strategies in, in addition to outbound sourcing. Uh, marketing, social media, events, uh, going to a careers page, utilizing LinkedIn and some of the tools that they have in order to grow your strategy. 
I think being able to manage these and, and put them all into your day, you know, whether it's a 40 hour week or an 80 hour week in a startup, I think is the most important thing that you can come through. And I think that was one of the biggest things that we had to, cha uh, that we had to get into when I came in. And we had 40 people. Uh, Kelsey was our recruiting coordinator at the time. We had one other recruiter in house as well. And probably looking at about 40 to 60 new open recs. Uh, then coming back in, in in 2013 and doing the same thing all over again uh, was a whole other challenge. So I think we've learned quite a bit in sort of stratifying our day, creating frameworks around what we want to do, and then implementing those consistently over and over again in order to scale up and, and operate in a very lean fashion. Um, I'd say this is probably the biggest one we went through. Okay, how about you, Ann? or Jim? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Keep mixing you guys up. No <laughs> problem. As long um, as you don't mix me up. <laughs> I'm not caddish. <laughs> Um, so wow, biggest challenge. Um, you know, I thought about that while Anthony was talking, and you know, when I first got to FireEye, um, like I said, we were less than 100 people, and Ashar Aziz, who's our founder, said, Jim, we need to go out and hire 80 engineers, like now. Like that was the first assignment. And so I thought, wow, how are we gonna hire 80 engineers? Well, we had a particular person we had to work closely with in hiring who had a completely different idea on what it took to hire engineers, or hire anybody for that matter. And so I say the biggest challenge that I had and that my team had right in the beginning is really taking that old paradigm and taking that thought process and what it takes to scale and what it takes to hire at a, at a fast pace um, and flip it upside down and say, everything you think you know about hiring is wrong. And so as the experts in hiring, let us teach you how to do that. Um, so our team, because what I call, we have street cred, we have a very powerful team. And so they were able to win over the hiring managers that came from so many different companies who all thought they had the right way to do it and really kind of bring them all under one thought process, right? Say, so here's how we're going to do it, here's how we're going to scale it, and here's how we're going to do it at a quick pace. Um, you know, I don't know everyone's numbers in the room, and Julian, our rep at LinkedIn, who's great, tells me all the time they're good, so I guess they're good. So we were able to hire thousands of people in an average of 20.2 days, um, average time to hire. So our team moves quickly, our team moves nimble, and they're fast. So I guess the takeaway would be getting the hiring managers to all work together in a process that, that's effective not have a bunch of one-off systems and one-off processes. That would be the biggest challenge, I would say, because when you're in a startup, everybody has the, the next big idea, right? Here's how we should do it. Here's how we find people. I know this method over here. We use these guys over here at this company. And bringing that all together and getting them all marching to the same, same beat of the same drum, that was the biggest challenge. And once we did that, the recruiting engine just hummed. So. I have nothing left to add. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I bet you do. How about you, Kat? <laughs> um, I would say, so interesting, Chartbeat, when I started, like I said, was a little over 10 people. Of an idealistic British CEO with a fancy accent who um, very much wants the company to be built a different way. No hierarchy, fragmented, all of that. And so working within that framework and trying to build a recruiting function that supports that well is, is interesting because ideally our profile of a person is somebody who is deep in expertise but doesn't necessarily want to manage a lot of people and also doesn't care if they have a fancy title. It's a little bit hard to come by. Um, so for me, one of the interesting things when I started was just pausing for a second and listening and kind of really taking in the company before you go, go, go. That is the mentality when you work for a small startup and you, you realize you have some pretty aggressive goals. But pausing for a second to listen to the leadership team, to be a part of that team that they trusted, um, was something that I thought um, made my life a lot easier. And building a, a culture that uh, where hiring is not solely on your shoulders, where everybody understands that it is also their job um, to help bring people in. Um, so outside of you know, building a great team for yourself, putting the right infrastructure in place, creating that trust, that was for me one of the biggest things. And I've done it now three times over, Chartbeat being, well now two and a half years, so a little longer than I normally stay. Um, it's been a really interesting, interesting journey, but I would say I'd, I'd leave that for you as piece, you know, pieces of advice. To give everybody some context, why don't we, you guys share kind of what, how your team is made up today? You know, how many people do you have on your team and what does it look like? We'll start with you, Anthony. Sure, uh, so we have an awesome recruiting coordinator, Katie, who does everything from managing our day to day, but also taking on uh, bigger programs and projects like on-campus recruiting, and she's done a fantastic job of that going through sort of the first iteration this fall. I also have two first-year recruiters who are kicking butt um, for being first-year recruiters and haven't been in an agency and trained quite a few folks up. I think they're third, fourth-year recruiters already, so I'm very pleased with 
with how they've ramped up, uh, ramped up. Uh, and that's Laura and Kelsey, and they're sitting right there, so just to make sure I embarrass them a little bit today. Uh, and then I'm also involved. We do have an HR team, uh, Kristen Scully, she's our director of HR, by far the best HR individual I've ever worked with, uh, and she really sort of takes things from once everybody signs their off letter and goes and takes care of the onboarding process. So very tall, uh, small, tight-knit team. Uh, we, we're asked to do quite a bit, and we share our responsibilities uh, across the board. So no egos, no job too small on our team. Uh, everybody runs a full desk, and we take on other small projects that will contribute to the more passive sourcing strategies, whether it be social media, events, any sort of program. Uh, we've done some pretty cool things with enhancing our image on LinkedIn and Glassdoor by getting folks on our team uh, to come in and, and actually uh, update their profiles, connect with other peoples on the team, and, and that was actually Kelsey's idea. We called it WAS, we're a software as a service company, so we were waffles as a service, and so everybody <laughs> that came in there and updated their profiles, we got, they got breakfast, waffles, and, and a few toppings. <laughs> okay, cool. And how about you, Jim? Size of your team? So how my team is made up is what you yeah. want to know? So, so when I first got there, I was the team, and then I had to build the team, obviously, to, to call and find all these people. Um, so if I've, known, I've got to know a lot of people in the industry, so I tapped a few people that I knew, started from there, and now my team is 25, something like that, somewhere in there. Um, and it consists of recruiting coordinators. Um, Lauren will embarrass Lauren. She's our social media czar out there. And uh, so we have recruiting coordinators, social media coordinators, um, whole team of senior recruiting candidate or recruiters, and we also have some junior recruiters as well. Uh, we actually run um, a training program for recruiters. I run one at least two or three times a week, uh, depending on how much they want to hear me talk. And uh, we go everything from building rapport, sales training, pimp your profiles, what we call it, um, how to train the, ma train the managers on how to hire, you name it. Um, but it's a pretty traditional model. We have recruiting coordinators. We have social media coordinator, which is new this year. And we have uh, all of our recruiters, like Andy, work a full desk um, from the intake meeting all the way through closing the candidates. So the training is voluntary? They can come if they want, or do you like take attendance? So yeah, I would, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, there's no, no voluntary training. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, the good news is the group has grown. I think word's getting out that they're actually learning a few things, so uh, that's always good. But uh, no, the training is definitely not mandatory, but it's just something that, you know, I have a saying, I have a saying at work. I, I'm a former athlete. I don't do any more of those for my kids. I, I have a saying there's great athletes make great coaches. And so if I want my job to be easy as a coach, leader, manager, whatever, then I need great athletes. Mm -hmm. I, I do. And the thing that I've, like, this big problem I've noticed for most recruiters is, you know, you go to school, you read a bunch of books, you do a lot of training, you get a job, and you stop doing all those things. Same thing with recruiters. Recruiters, especially when they get into corporate America, they don't have to eat what they kill, right? So every day it gets a little bit lazier. They, get a little, they don't dot the I's or cross the T's as much. So that's why we run training. We want to make sure that they keep their tools sharp, and whether they're out there looking for people, as all of you guys know, especially startups, um, finding the best talent, the top talent, is tough to do. And if you don't have great recruiters, it makes it even more difficult. I mean, we can talk about the story and the value, but if you don't have great recruiters, then you're not going to be able to get a top talent. So we train them up, we keep them fresh, keep them sharp. Great. And Kat, how about, how's your team made up? My team is small. My team is myself. Um, <laughs> as I said, I, I um, so what's interesting about Charbeat is we have cross-team collaboration. So marketing takes care of a lot of our, you know, how you stay on brand and I, you know, help dictate and, and kind of align um, our recruiting brand with that. Um, we have a really strong hiring culture, like I said, every hiring manager, every executive is effectively the hiring manager and they are responsible for making sure their teams are in line. But I would say because that culture is so strong, I've been able to survive for a long period of time on my own, um, growing Chartbeat uh, with a PEO, so I don't handle payroll and benefits administration. I can't say I do everything on my own. Um, and we have an office manager and operations manager that takes care of a lot of kind of your internal culture building and um, kind of retention mechanisms. And we meet to talk about those types of things. But I am in the process of building out the team for Chartbeat. We are finally at a place where I need to sleep and I can no longer sustain, um, you know, the 100 people that we will likely hire in the next year. Um, is, is not, uh, well, it's not healthy for me to, to work as much as I do. Neither is, I think, good for the company. Can we keep up with the pace that uh, we've, been, uh, we've been going at? So uh, I, right now I'm looking for a recruiter, a right-hand person to join my team, good as luck. well as an HR person. 
Um, I'm in New York, in case anyone wants to talk. Okay, I'm done pitching. <laughs> Always be recruiting, right? <laughs> hey, this is the right platform, right? There you go, there you go. Well, let's move on then to question number two, and we'll start with Jim, so we'll get you uh, prepared to answer. What do you think it takes for a recruiting leader to be successful in a startup or rapid growth situation? Uh, it's kind of, it's gonna sound like a canned answer, but I, I've been at, like Anthony, I mean, I've been at quite a few startup companies and I've, I've seen a lot of different HR organizations and just leadership teams in general. And I think the where I've been the most successful and especially at FireEye is that you have to have buy-in from the top. It sounds canned, but it's true. From the, from the CEO down, hiring has to be your number one, two, and third highest priority. It can't be somewhere down here at five or six. Um, it has to be number one. And if you have that executive um, support, what I call air cover, if you have that executive air cover, as you're trying to roll out these processes and change the mindset, like I mentioned earlier, about these hiring managers that have 15 different ways to hire people and get everybody on the same page, it really does help. So I think that would be number one. Definitely have to have air cover, definitely have to executive, um, executive buy-in, and they have to support you. Uh, number two, it sounds a little cliche, the great athletes make great coaches. You have to have a great team. Um, our team is no different than a marketing team, engineering team, anybody. You have to have the top talent if you're gonna go after top talent. And so you have to have a great team. Um, so I would say that if you wanna be a successful group, you have to have executive buy-in, great team, you have to have the people to execute that plan. So that would be it. So what do you look for in the individual recruiters that you hire in terms of background or experience? Um, so I get that question asked a lot, um, especially at barbecues. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds crazy. You know, my kid wants to get in a recruiting gym. I hear they make good money. What should they do? Or what do you <laughs> look? What do you look? What do you look for? <laughs> Cat pays really well in New York, by the way. Um, no. And so what do, they, what do they look for? Everybody's and recruiting for me today. Exactly. So. <laughs> um, so, you know, like, what do you look for in a recruiter? What characteristics, what traits? Um, I don't think it's any different. I look at recruiters as salespeople, so I don't think it's any different than any other sales role. It's um, sense of urgency, um, an abnormal sense of urgency, actually, actually feeling anxious if you're away from your phone or your desk, that you should be talking to people and reaching out to people. Um, you know, attention to detail, believe it or not, probably not so much for recruiters. Um, there's not a whole lot of attention to detail for recruiters, but high sense of urgency, do it now mentality, someone who takes initiative, people that are problem solvers. There are people that identify problems and there are people that just solve problems. We look for people that are problem solvers and we look for people that take initiative and just go out and run and do it. Okay. So. Great. How about you, Kat? What do you think it takes to be successful? I think for someone to be successful in a startup especially, you definitely have to have the trust of the leadership team. Whether or not you're a part of that team, um, really, it, it's kind of a moot point, right? If I did not have the trust of my CEO and my COO, I could not do half the things that I do. Um, if I did not have the trust of the rest of the executive team, no one would listen to me. Um, and so I think when you're working for a smaller company and you have a lot of young leaders, a lot of first-time executives, it's important to build that trust with that leadership team and get them on your side. Um, I also think about when you join a company, you really need to make sure that your, what t the type of company that you want to build is aligned with the type of company this leadership team wants to stand behind. I need to know that your views on people are the same as mine, or that you'll challenge me to improve my views on people. Um, I will not join a company wherein I do not feel like that leadership team will take care of the people that I bring on board, because every hire you bring on board is attached to your name. And I, I place a lot of value in that, and I, you know, I'm very passionate about what I do for a reason. Um, and I think because we all work at startups, or we all want to, you have to be flexible. Things will not always go your way. It will be chaotic, hence the name of this session. But you have to be ready to be nimble and kind of be okay that things are not as organized as you want to be because there's just not enough time in the day sometimes. And the end goal is for you to make those hires count. Um, it's not about closing Rex, it's about making that count. Because if it doesn't count, you'll have to do that again very, very shortly. And that's a headache that unfortunately when you're a one-man team, a two-man team, you just don't have the time to do that. Neither should you ever have to be that stressed. Um, so that's it. So with a smaller team, and in your case just yourself, how do you suggest that somebody start building that trust? How do you go about that? Uh, be strong in your in your area of expertise, right? I constantly have to remind our CEO that I was hired here to be this, so let me be this. 
for you. Start to let go of the things that I can be good at. Show them through your actions that you have that expertise that you can bring it to the table. It's not about changing things right away. It's about getting people to a place where they feel like you know, they're collaborating with you. Um, I have a lot of, and I'll give this as a very short example, um, you know, we hire a lot of front-end engineers at Chartbeat, and we were not getting the caliber that we wanted, and our, my front-end team, they just completely redid the whole process themselves. I didn't have to initiate, I didn't have to make them do it, they just did it, because they understand the value of bringing good talent in, and I think when you breed that type of mentality, it kind of filters down from the head of engineering to, you know, to his entire team. And when you're a company like ours that is very front end focused and we're very known for that, it warms my heart to see that that happens organically without, you know, having to twist someone's arm to get to do it. All right, Anthony, what are your thoughts on what it takes to be successful? Yeah, definitely everything that Jim and Kat had to say, I would, I would piggyback on pretty quickly. I think, you know, getting executive buy-in is important. And a big reason why I joined AppDirect was because I had that relationship with Daniel and Nicholas, our co-founders, from my consulting days, where we had worked together when it was just the two of them in a, in a small office to hire engineer number one and, and continue to, to, you know, have a strong relationship over time. Uh, but I also think it's, it's setting expectations early, and it's, it's really sort of building that infrastructure for growth. So in the same way that you're going to go build out a new building, you got to do your infrastructure first. You have to understand how you're going to evaluate the people that are going to come in and, and really build a framework around that and for the other departments that you're going to eventually come to build out over time as well too. Really training your hiring managers and interview teams to get it right the first time. Uh, we only have one shot at evaluating candidates, but we, it's, it's not just the evaluation, it's also our own performance. We need to be able to show in there and give each individual that comes through our office as a guest a great candidate experience. We only have one shot at most of these folks that come through in a highly competitive environment. So I think training, setting that infrastructure, putting those frameworks in place so everybody knows what their role is, is huge for us being able to capitalize. And as a recruiting leader, it's important for me to drive that influence, uh, to be consistent, and to really sort of manage my schedule and our priorities in order for us to get things done as quickly as possible. Uh, when identifying team players, uh, whether they be for our recruiting team or for other AppDirect team members, we have a set of core values, and I'm fortunate that we have those core values very early on in place, and that's helped us grow and build around the people that we've hired very early on. Uh, so we look for people that, that take great ownership and, and are really answer first. They're data driven. They take accountability. They jump in feet first. They have that intensity. So a sense of urgency, as Jim mentioned, is, is highly important. And a lot of times why, why we uh, refer to athletes is because they understand that training regimen. They understand what it takes to get to the next level. They know what hustle means uh, and they want to outpace their competition. Being positive, uh, you know, you're going to get shot down. I, I like to think of recruiting as baseball, but probably worse in a lot of ways. If you hit 300 uh, in your sourcing strategy, you are a Hall of Famer. You should be closing deals over 90% if you actually get to an offer and everybody will throw it out there. But you've got to have that positive mental attitude to get through those tough times, uh, the humility to try to get better, and sort of that long-term goal to, to understand what you're trying to achieve uh, and how you can actually work backwards. So if you need to hire 10 people over the next month or so, how are you going to get there? How are you going to retrace back what, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and, and how it works for your company as well, too. So I think setting those expectations very early <coughs> on, setting that framework, that infrastructure that you need in order to grow is one of the most critical things that you can do very early on as a recruiting leader, and it's going to help you run a lot leaner over time as well, too. So we've been able to double with only three of us, uh, two of which are awesome first-year recruiters, and you know we're going to try and do that again next year. And uh, I think because we have these processes in place, we're going to be able to do so. How about in terms of relationship building? I mean, you have two new recruiters, mm -hmm. you're recruiting for some really in-demand talent in a very in-demand talent area. How do you kind of uh, build in that relationship building skill or is that even a big part of what you do? Yeah, so I think the big distinguishing feature there is traits versus skills. Uh, you cannot teach traits to people. Uh, and that's one thing that you're gonna go out and identify in recruiting. And that's why you're seeing so much association with sales and recruiting these days is because you're trying to hire the right sort of trait that um, personable, likable, high intensity closer to be on your recruiting team. Uh, skills are a whole other thing that you can actually teach. I can teach somebody how to source. I can teach somebody how to write a, an engaging uh, template. Uh, and reuse that. I can teach people how to walk somebody through the candidate process and give them a great experience to do a debrief. You can teach these things, but you need to have those set of core values uh, to be able to identify the right traits that are going to make your team successful. 
Uh, so relationship building, uh, you know, there's a few sales tactics in there that you can sort of keep that long tail relationship high, whether it's an initial touch point, you're walking them through the process, maybe it's three, four week recruiting process, not 20.2 days like Jim, uh, or it's that six to nine month candidate that you're thinking strategically over time, this is gonna be the right person for that role six months down the road. How do we sort of maintain that relationship? How do I keep that relationship figure, figure high? And how do I give that person a great experience even though we might not have the perfect role for them right now? Um, so I think that's the big distinguishing feature there is that you have to identify the difference between traits and skills. You can teach skills, but you can't teach traits. Okay. All right, let's move on to the third question. We'll start with you, Kat. Maybe share with us one of your secrets. What's your most effective sourcing recruiting strategy that you have today? I, I would say, to, to kind of go off what Anthony was just saying or what you were saying around building relationships is um, I'd say one of the most effective things for me um, running kind of a solo ship for a long time is uh, making sure that I have a very strong network of people and that my people have a strong network of people. And that means every executive, every developer, every salesperson. Um, because of that, our referral percentage is always upwards of 40%, which makes my life just you know, that much easier. It doesn't mean that every referral is a great referral, but it does mean that people are looking out for you. And in all the places that you might not have access to or all the places you didn't even think to look. And so when I look at running a lean team initially, you need to find somebody who is equally good at doing that because it makes it that much easier to find great talent. And a really good example of this is I was hiring for salespeople early in 2013, didn't even hire this person, and late in 2013, I was hiring a head of finance, a pretty big role on top of everything else, and that guy that I didn't hire earlier in the year sent me my current head of finance, and he's like, I have no idea what you want, but this guy's great, and if, if you guys meet in the middle somewhere, he's moving from LA. Never would have found him otherwise. And New York City being the city of finance, you would think that there are plenty of folks that would do well you know, in that role. But it was very interesting for me to see something like that come together and validate the fact that you need to treat every candidate well. Because you actually never know when that's going to come back. And, and it pays off. I think it absolutely does pay off. Anthony, what's one of your secrets that you're willing to share with us? Yeah, I, I, I've had trouble coming up with an answer to this question because I, I don't think that anything that we do is, is really new. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I struggle to think that there is a great secret in recruiting. There, there's probably not, to be, to be completely honest. Uh, you know, you have to do it. You, you have to know what's, what's expected of you. You have to go out and you have to hustle. Uh, you have to do it over and over and over again. And you need to take the best qualities that come from sales and marketing and other positions that we're now starting to inject that sort of skills DNA into recruiting. You need to adopt those and become excellent at them. Uh, so I mean, in terms of strategies that we've gone after, utilize the team that you have. If, if you're a small startup, uh, set those expectations very early on with your hiring managers, your interview teams, with your uh, executive and leadership teams that this is how we're going to recruit. This is the information that I've gathered from the rest of the market to say this is the best practice that is out there today. These are the, these are the great new secrets that are here in recruiting but also have been adopted from sales and marketing over time. They're going to help us be more effective. Uh, start training your team and make it, make it a regular thing. Every quarter, make recruiting part of new hire orientation. Uh, if you have a, a new team member that you want to put into the interview lineup, make sure you train them properly. Help them understand what is expected of them during that interview performance. It's not interviewing and asking everybody to, to get the most out of them. It's how can we get the most out of them during that interview by being well prepared, uh, but also studying uh, people's backgrounds, uh, but going in there trying to close the deal. That's how your interview teams should be thinking about this. Not necessarily evaluating everybody, but I'm trying to close this person and get them to the next step. Uh, a couple other things, you know, just be active. Uh, stay humble. Understand that you can learn and try new things over and over again, but you just have to do so with a sort of sense of urgency. So no big secrets that I, that I think are out there. Uh, it's just, you know, continuing to try new things, uh, doing so at a high rate of speed, and, and being very detail-oriented and following up in your work. Okay, Jim? Big secrets. So I thought about this, and I agree. There's there is no silver bullet, right? There's no silver bullet. Nothing's going to ever, um, like I said, be a better solution than pounding the phone or getting on in mail and talking to candidates. However, I did. I tried to think back of what we did in the very beginning. We still do some today. Actually, most of it today. 
And so, like Kat said, employee referrals has been huge for us, huge. Um, it's no secret, I mean, there's, there's, employee referrals are big. When we first started doing our employee referral program, nobody knew we had an employee referral program. They just didn't know, they're heads down, working, working hard. Um, so we obviously, I guess, you know, revitalized the, the interview, the employee referral program. And some of the things we did, this is our secret sauce, this is what we did, and it worked. And we were upwards of 55 to 56% employee referrals um, in our big growth mode. Is we have what we call new hire social, engineering social. Okay, so the engineering socials and the new hire socials happen once a quarter. Um, engineering has their own, sort, their own social because they're special. Whether you like it or not, they are. Um, <laughs> Not, and they are. They, you have to have your own. Um, sometimes, you yeah, too. yeah, I'll remind you. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, sometimes they're themed, it can be a casino night, it can just be hangout, drinks and food, um, you name it. So everyone can do that, that's a no-brainer. Well, at a startup environment, most of you guys probably remember, or you're living it now, there's no swag. There's no backpacks, there's no t-shirts, there's no little chaj keys, there's nothing. And so we were no different. We had zero backpacks, zero, zero <laughs> swag whatsoever. So we came up with these awesome backpacks, fire backpacks. And every 10 referrals that you give us, you get a backpack. So then at the New Hire Social, every referral you give us, not only do you get the backpack with 10, if you bring 20, you get a backpack and a jacket that we paid for out of a recruiting budget, and you get a raffle ticket. So for every employer referral that you bring, you get a raffle ticket. Then you come to the party, you bring your raffle tickets to win Beats headsets, iPad minis, you name it, and our employee referrals went through the roof, right? Everyone likes free swag. Don't give me your, I mean, they get 5,000 bucks if you find a guy or a free backpack. They care about the backpack more than the $5,000. Uh, <laughs> but, but it is, I mean, you see them running around campus now like a badge of honor, like the FireEye backpack, because you can't get it. You can only get it if you give us referrals, that's it. Can't buy it, can't earn it other than referrals. So that's one thing. So new hire social for every new hire, Engineering social for just engineers once a quarter is what we did. Um, also, too, not to sound like a big homer here because we're at the LinkedIn conference, um, we work very closely with our LinkedIn team. Julian's there in the audience, we'll embarrass him. Um, one of the things we do all the time is called, we call it internally our sharing campaign. Again, tied to employee referrals. We've taught, with the help of Julian, of course, uh, we've taught all, everybody at FireEye to be a brand ambassador, to be a salesperson like Kat was mentioning for FireEye. And we've basically have taught everybody how to share in two clicks or less. So when we're doing an intake meeting or we're, we're sitting down with our teams that we support, we teach the hiring managers and the interview teams how to share jobs. Um, it doesn't seem very difficult to do, but when you dumb it down to like a fifth grade level, they seem to do it more often, um, which is good. Um, so that's what we've done. Employee referral program, of course, that's a canned answer, but the way we did it, free backpacks, free swag, you guys should own it. Get a referral, get a raffle ticket for every referral, get prizes. Throw them in there, have good times, give them some alcohol, and they, the referrals just keep coming. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the, and again, I'm, I was trying to figure out, I'm going to give you guys a takeaway of what, how, exactly how we did it. So when we're, I'll give you guys some more information if you want to know. But, Absolutely. So when we're at these socials, we literally have the TA team is standing by like the Apple store with laptops in hand. And they're coming in, and they just give us any name they want, and we look them up on LinkedIn. And our program is simple. We just need a name. I don't need a resume, I don't need anything. Just give me a name and maybe a, a company that they used to work for, we'll track them down, right? Because anyway, you gotta be good, right? You've gotta put the groundwork in. And so that's all we need, that's, that, that counts for us. And so they're there with laptops in hand, looking people up, registering referrals, giving them their free stuff, and they're lined up out the door to get it. So that's been a big, big program for us, and that's how we did it. Right There's your down. secret. There that was go. a great answer. Right? Write that down. The only thing I took out of that was backpacks. So yeah. write down backpacks. That seems to be the answer. I, I'm serious about, I mean, <laughs> we, we have people come over, I mean, now we're, we're global now, but I mean, we have people coming in from Dubai or the UK or Australia. The only thing they want while they're on campus is a backpack. And we make them earn it. We say, hey, you need 10 referrals. So in terms of your global organization, how do you handle that with the social? So that's a good question. Um, un, un, they do get an invitation, however, <laughs> <laughs> however, uh, we have pretty low attendance when it comes to our uh, global population. But, but facilities is actually really good about including them in any type of event we have uh, on the local, you know, in the local regional offices. Uh, but the new hire social and the engineering social, you have to be in headquarters. Yeah, okay. unfortunately. Do you do that for external referrals as well too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you mean, you mean as far as like an agency? Say you have a. External partner client that refers you to ten people. Would you send them a backpack? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, no question. Fire eye. No question. Anthony, everyone. I'll get you a backpack for you. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me know your jacket. Let me know your jacket size. For twenty, I'll get you a jacket. My fees are a little higher than that. There you go. All right. All right. 
Well, all of you have mentioned in some regards something about candidate experience and how important that is in terms of your recruiting process. So Anthony, I think you brought it up first. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how either you're focused on candidate experience or with a small team, you're either able to deliver a candidate experience. It's just really important, right? You, you have one opportunity to make a first impression and you need to sort of carry that impression all the way through. And so I think it's an attention to detail. The way I've, I've tried to relate it to the team is I want us to be like the concierge of a really nice hotel when you walk in the front door. I want us to have smiles. I want us to know where every facility is. I want us to know the background, the information on the company that we work for. And I want us to sort of be service oriented. Uh, my father's in hospitality, he runs a small business. I spent about five, six years in hospitality, serving tables, bartending, throwing events, you name it. And that, that's sort of what left a good impression on me. You know, even today when I go into a restaurant and the service quality is just mediocre, I say, yeah, there's so many things that this person could be doing to give me a much better experience to, to capture my attention and you know, provide that sort of loyalty to that experience as well too. Uh, you know, the other things that you can continue to do, take great notes. Uh, you know, that, that first impression that, that you put on that person, ask them a lot of questions. Take great notes on that. Bring that through the experience uh, and, and through each other touch point that you have with that individual. Show them that you're paying attention. Um, and I think it's just those very small things uh, that you can learn serving tables or, or, you know, throwing your own little event that really sort of bring it all together. Uh, but I think we carry that to our interview teams as well, too. Uh, we don't want them to think of it as an interview. I want you to think of it as a performance. You know what your roles are. You know what your questions are. You know how we're going to evaluate these candidates and how we're going to continue to measure them and, and what we're asking them to do when they actually come work at AppDirect. So let's continue to think about our table manners, the things that we learned in preschool or that our parents taught us very, very early, early on, and let's apply those to the, the candidate experience as well, too. And that's how we've kept it pretty simple, because hopefully everybody that's on our team has gone to eat at a nice restaurant or, or gone and stayed at a hotel at least once or twice and, and can distinguish the difference. Jim, how about you and candidate experience? Yeah, so I mean, obviously it's very important, right? It goes without saying. Um, I think I learned pretty early on in my career about candidate experience. I really wasn't thinking about it, to be honest with you, when I was just working my desk. And I worked at a company which I will leave nameless, but uh, we churned and burned through so many candidates. And you don't really think about it because you're working your desk, you're on the phone, you're, you're talking to people, and you just want to get people in for interviews, right? As fast as you can, as many as you can. Um, you guys have probably all seen the funnel, 100 people, down to 10 people, down to one hire, all that good stuff. So you, you have to bring candidates in to interview. The problem is, if you don't treat them with respect, if, you don't, if you're not hospitable, right? Playing Anthony's words there, it's, it comes back to bite you. Because even if that person, let's say they come in there two, three years of experience, they aren't the right fit. They, aren't, they don't have the right technical ability at this point. Well, six years later, three years later, five years later, they will. And if they have a bad experience, as you guys all know, they're going to go out and tell 20 people that the company was horrible, they treated them wrong, I sat for 20 minutes, no one came and greeted me, they gave me the hardest question they could ever think of in their life, I could never, <laughs> there's no way I could ever answer it, neither could they. Um, they're never going to come back to your company. And so if you want to be a sustainable company, you're going to make it throughout all these years, you need to tap back into that candidate pool. Like in our industry, security, there's only a finite number of people right now that are available in our space, right? And they'll grow, but right now, the type of people that we want right now, it's, it's tough to find, the numbers are low, right? So if you don't treat them right, or them with respect, you're never going to get them back if they just don't have to be right for that job. Mm -hmm. So it is key, um, you know, and, and you don't think about it until you've been through that experience. And then five years later, you call them back and say, I'll never go interview that company again. And you're like, I guess it made a difference. Right. So yeah, right. it's definitely important. Now, Kat, you're a department of one. How do you manage candidate experience for all of the candidates that you're working with? You have a lot of help. Um, every hiring manager helps. Um, every person that's involved in hiring understands that it is a privilege to be part of this process. It is not because you are the only engineer here, no. It is a privilege for you to be part of the decision-making process. I reject everybody that applies. I respond to everybody that applies. It is time-consuming and is probably not the best use of my time. I do it while I watch TV, but it is undoubtedly one of the most valuable things that I've learned in my career is that pays in dividends. That little time that you took to send them an email to tell them they're not a good fit or to explain why they're not a good fit for this particular role or get on the phone um, quickly is invaluable. It makes my job easier and makes the reputation um, that you want to bring to market, it solidifies it. And when you spend so much time building your recruiting brand, why ruin it by offering up bad candidate experiences? It's just counterproductive. 
Um, so I would say if I, if I had any piece of advice, I, one of the most important things to me in this career is providing people with a good um, candidate experience in the same way that when I look for a new opportunity, I want to be treated really well because you do bring a specific skill set to the table. If it's not a good fit now, it may be later and that, that's going to be the key in your hires for 2015, 2016, 2017. You have to think about that. If you're, you're in this for the long haul, you have to think about that. I have one more question, then we're going to open it up for you guys. So this is off script. Uh, we'll see what Whoa. you guys come up with. The title of this session is Organizing the Chaos. So if you could only choose one tool in your arsenal that helps you organize the chaos and helps you to recruit the best talent to your organization, what would that tool process uh, thing that you do be? And we'll Let's start down on the LinkedIn. end. But we'll start with Kat. <laughs> don't, don't start with me. Okay, we'll start with Anthony and we'll work our way back. Yeah, throw, throw me on the spot. Uh, my calendar is, is probably the most important thing that, that I have. Uh, I plan my day the night before. I know who I'm chatting with. I've done my research the night before. If I'm sourcing, I know what companies I'm going after. I know what I'm looking for. And I'm ready to go. Uh, I don't waste any time when I get in in the morning. I'm able to accomplish more in a highly concentrated amount of time and, and then get back to, to leading the team and, and helping us grow up um, or finding something new to work on. So I think the more you can manage your day, the more you can stay organized, uh, the more effective you'll be. Uh, every other tool that's out there is really important, but I think it's how you own your day and, and how you sort of take care of the rest of the organization by time management. All right, Jim. So I get to pick one thing to use, right? One thing. One if you tool. had to like claw it away with your I would no, I would say phone. Yeah. But, yeah. Phone. Oh, but I pick yeah. one tool. But nowadays it's probably laptop. But uh, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, gosh, the one thing. Wow. There. Let's see. There's so many. In fact, I'm going to steal an answer from Cat when we talked like probably a couple weeks ago, and we talked about tools. And you know, I wouldn't say there's one particular tool that's significantly better than any other tool if you don't know how to use it properly. Right, and that's, that's the truth. Um, I think the analogy I gave one on the phone was like, it's almost like a surround sound system. Everybody buys the best surround sound system they can find, they do all the research, and they get home and they stick it on auto. That's all they do, they never tweak it, they never manipulate any of the settings. And so, for instance, like, again, not to seem like a homer, but we obviously, probably like most people in the room, we use LinkedIn a lot. I mean, we, we use it a lot. It's our number one tool that we use on a daily basis, but it's one of those things that's a monster, it's huge, right? It has so much ability and so many features that if you don't partner up with your LinkedIn reps, I know this sounds like total homer status here, but it's absolutely true. Um, to tell you the truth, when we first started using LinkedIn, I didn't realize that we'd get that much help. I, and one day I was talking to one of our reps, like, well, why don't we just come in here and show you guys how to do that? I'm like, you guys will do that? Um, that's great. And so they should have never told us that because now we have them in there constantly um, <laughs> showing us everything. So uh, it, it definitely, I don't think there's one tool that's better than the other if you don't know how to use that tool, right? Yeah. And so whatever tool you guys choose, whatever environment you're in, whatever your budget allows, become a master at using that tool um, because you're spending the budget on it and you might as well use, learn how to use it. And if it's LinkedIn, call your rep. They'll come out and help. <laughs> Kat, you got an answer or the gym still yours? So <laughs> mine. Um, one tool. I, I would say invest a lot of time early on to building your engineering or your brand, your recruiting brand, your engineering brand if you hire a lot of engineers, which many of uh, us do. Um, make that investment. It is time consuming and annoying, and it doesn't necessarily pay right away, but once you have it, and when it's, once it's established, it, it definitely helps, and, and more than helps. It shapes how you do things. And so if I was gonna go back and kind of redo every time that I've gone and, and built a, a startup, it's, I would start from there, is to really understand the types of people that you're going after, and the profiles that work across the board, regardless of the position, and, and then start to get through those traits and those skills and figure out how to kind of build upon that. Your brand is important, and if you are not attending any sessions about that, you should. <laughs> and you have an opportunity over the next couple of days. So let's open it up for questions. There's a microphone in the center of the room here. And I've never been at a LinkedIn Talent Connect session where there weren't people lined up to ask questions. So who has a question for the panelists here? We have a volunteer. You certainly can get, if you guys want to get up and get in line, that'd be great. 
you're right there by the microphone. So how do you guys approach interview training? I have hiring managers that are great at interviewing, others that are horrible. Mm -hmm. um, do you try to individualize it with certain hiring managers or do something across the board? Uh, we do a couple things. We do interviewing one-on-one, -on -one, uh, which is really sort of going over what expectations are of you based on cultural values and how we evaluate those different values. And then we also do interviewing 201, uh, which is usually more uh, centralized or focused on actually each department. Uh, so we'll bring everybody in through interviewing one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll sort of do breakout sessions so that everybody can, as a little small workshop, understand what their roles are, what questions they're going to be asking, and how they're going to be evaluating candidates throughout the process. Uh, we also do a little bit around sort of just vision and values, uh, just sort of cement that in. Uh, we want people that are continuing to sort of give that, that nice service-oriented experience, if you will, uh, but also know how they're evaluating folks. Uh, and we do that maybe every three to six months. We've also introduced it as part of new hire training. And then anytime we kick off a new search now, we kick it off with a brief. We go through those things. We log that for, for you know, the sake of, of growing it over time and not having to do these things as often. Uh, but I think really sort of around log management, taking good notes, and then setting expectations. And we just try to do this as often as possible. You want to go ahead? Sure. So um, we have grown so fast in such a short amount of time, we actually don't have a formalized program, uh, like Anthony's mentioning. Matter of fact, I just put together a 32-slide deck presentation on behavioral interviewing and all that great stuff that we'll be rolling out as part of our learning and development uh, program. Uh, but you know, again, I'll go back to the great athletes who make great coaches. We, I have a great team of recruiters that work individually with their hiring managers and their hiring teams. And they, they work very close with them as far as getting feedback, how the interview goes, what's candidate experience about. And they they have, since they have such a great relationship, they share their, you know, the experiences that we've heard from the candidates and then tweak it from there. But we have a lot of experienced interviewers, so some of them did need some help. But for the most part, it's been pretty smooth. So unfortunately, we have not had a formalized program like that. Great. Kat, do you have any training for your hiring manager? We do. Um, so we do, uh, in general, onboarding, which is uh, nine sessions that every single hire at our company goes through. One of those is spent with me, and part of that is just introducing them to the lay of the land. And um, at some point, I know that this is a person that will likely be involved in the hiring process, and so we go through our baseline competencies. There are four things um, that we look for in every chart beat hire kind of like the spirit of, of our company. And so those are kind of the things that I teach first, just to get them in the mindset um, to know that they'll be participating in that at some point in time. And then you, we do hiring labs. I do team-specific hiring labs. You have very, very young teams, some people fresh out of college, making very big decisions. And so I spend a lot of time going through and carving out what those team-specific competencies are. and asking them to help me refine the interview process. Part of what I think makes it makes interviewing um, not such a chore for us at Chartbeat is that it is a collaborative process. It is not just me saying, this is how it's done. I, I mean, yes, this is kind of how it's done, but what questions do we think are valuable? The people that do it day to day are going to offer more value to it than like the Google search that I did on how to hire an engineer, right? So it's about making it a collaborative process for us, and that's worked. Great. We have a couple questions right here. If you guys could use the microphone so we can get it on the recording. Go ahead. So all three of you sort of mentioned infrastructure and process, and I know, Jim, you had mentioned, you know, 20.2 days, which is very impressive, but can you speak a little bit more to what specific your process looks like with hiring? Sure. No, I'm actually glad you asked that question, because I was going to try to tie into what, something that what Anthony said earlier. Um, you know, we really do have a recruiting engine, right? We are on the front lines as far as recruiters, recruiter coordinators, talent, social media, you name it. We are on the front, ground, front line. We're the boots on the ground. However, there's a huge back office and operations behind that. We can't move at the speed of light if there's any type of bottleneck, right? So our process is, I'll just give you a flow chart here. It's really simple. It starts with obviously recruiting the candidate. It starts, well, it starts with an intake meeting with a hiring manager. Find out what they're looking for. You go out, you find the candidate. We get them through the interview process. Now we want to make them an offer. What do we do, right? So in the beginning, we were doing all of it. But, and as you grow as a startup company, you, be, you do less and less of it because I want to pay our recruiters to recruit, not create offer letters and do onboarding. Um, so now we have an entire HR operations team behind us, which is great. Um, and what I was going to mention earlier while Anthony was talking is that it's really important as a leader, the leader question there is being able to work closely with all the functions within HR. 
Because if you have this us and them mindset, even within HR, within the recruiting, HR ops, HRIS, uh, HRBPs, nothing is smooth. You can't, if you're, if, you know, someone on my team is looking for an offer letter on a Friday afternoon and it's four o'clock and the person in HR ops just, that you guys don't get along, you know, they're out the door, that offer's not going out till Monday. Um, so it's really important to have that relationship with them, and it's really important to t teach them what your needs are as a recruiter. Because a lot of times, like, hey, I just need this offer by four. Well, sit down with them, explain it. Why do you need it by four? What happens if we don't get it by four? Are we going to lose this candidate, right? We have a saying in our office, time kills deals, right? And so every time you have a candidate and they're ready to be closed, like Anthony's saying, you've got to get them across the line, right? Or her across the line, right? Um, so you have to work with the team. So it goes from all we talked about goes over to HR Ops, we go online, we get in our ATS, we create the offer letter within there, we call it offer approval, goes over to HR, goes, then we start the background check as well, that goes over to our Ops team, Ops team picks it up and goes crazy. It used to be a huge bottleneck for us, to be honest with you, it used to be huge. Um, we came up with what we call a service level agreement, SLA with them and their director to say, hey look, you're killing us here. We need to have something laid out to say when you're going to get us the offer. If we give it to you by noon, could we expect it by four? Is that unrealistic? If we get it to you by five, we, we get it. We're not going to get it same day. Um, but if there's an exception, you know, like I have to have this today by five, and I gave it to you at 4.30, let's find a way to make that work, right? And so fortunately, um, the leader of that team is great, and we work very closely with her, and we've been able to st really streamline our process, hence the 20.2 days, um, and still hire great people. So I hope that answered your question. If not, happy to elaborate more on that. Another question? Hi, I'm Linda, and uh, what I'd like to know is, what have you done in the past to ensure that you're always hiring rock stars? Oh, good question. What are we, <laughs> Anthony's like stirring. Uh, I'm like, I'll, I'll ask <laughs> right now. Answer, but Kat hasn't answered one. I don't know so. if I have an answer. <laughs> rock star is different in every company, right? So it's about defining what that is first. Um, it is it is easy to be trigger happy when you uh, when you hire. Um, it is easy to want to close, 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 but if you don't know what you're closing, it's impossible to define Rockstar. And Rockstar at my company might not be Rockstar at FireEye, right? It's totally different, and so set the standards. That's how you make sure that you hire good people, is if you lay the foundation. Um, and I am the type of person that wants to get things done, checked off my list. Like, I still write physical to-do lists because I find it very satisfying to check something off or to highlight it. Um, I'm type A if you can't tell. But, but I think the important thing about Rockstar and that sense of like top candidate is you need to define that well. And um, I have had to stop many, uh, many an executive or many a hiring manager and make them think about exactly what they want before you go and you start. That intake meeting, is so important. I don't call it that, but maybe I should. Um, it is one of the most important meetings that you'll have. And if you are not, if you are not established in that meeting, if you don't know going into it, you're, you're going to have to, this is when you end up with a pipeline that doesn't make sense. And you're confused and stressed, and you can't close the rec in 20.2 days. That's just how it goes. I don't know how he does that, but. <laughs> That's the real secret. I can't give you that one. That's a special sauce. I'm going so, to work at FireEye, guys. You want to go? Yeah, I, I, just a little bit to add. I, it's really important to understand what you're trying to hire this person to do when you come to the role and, and sort of what those expe expectations are and how you actually define success. These are, these are all very important at the, uh, sort of up front until they sign their offer letter and actually start work. But what are the facilities you have in place following day one that actually help define success that sort of keep that in there and measure it over time? Uh, do you have those core values to how cultural fit works? Do you have those KPIs and metrics actually set out? Are your hiring managers actually intent on sitting down with each one of their team members every three to six months as part of your review process and, and asking them you know, why they're not meeting this cultural expectation of ownership or humility and also why they've been maybe a little bit short on their KPIs? And I think it's also important to have somewhat of an up or out culture in a, in a fast growing technology company. And, and that might sound a, little bit, sound a little scary to some folks, but we want to hire the best. Uh, we want people that are high performance, that have a high ceiling, uh, really high output and potential. And you want to hire for those traits. 
uh, rather than just the skills that you want them to come in and do, especially when you're asking folks to wear a lot of hats. So are you building in that sort of infrastructure and framework to continue to review people and hold them to a very high standard, but also work with them in order to reach their potential? So I think it's very important in the identification and the closing process to have those things in place, but even more vital, and I think you can get the more, most out of each employee if you actually have those on the other half of it as well, too, once they've started and continue to grow. So I would say I'd take both these answers and combine it into one answer and, and give you my version. So I, I call it, the th as a recruiter, you have to be good at what I call the three pillars of recruiting. Like someone asked me earlier, what does it take to be a good recruiter? I call it three pillars of recruiting. Pillar one, can you identify top talent? Can you get online? Can you find a profile? Can you find a resume and you say, this Gallagher guy looks great. His profile on paper looks amazing, right? Number two, second pillar, can you get him on the phone or in the building for an interview? So number two. Number three is closing, right? It goes without saying. What Anthony was saying earlier, I, I personally believe that sales and recruiting is a learned skill. It really is. There's people like Kat that are type A that are more comfortable talking in front of a crowd or talking on the phone or asking the uncomfortable questions, making the unreasonable request, but it is a learned skill. So you take those three things, right? Then I tie in how do you ensure you find the best people to what Kat and Anthony said, understand what you're looking for. But more than that too, not just the profile, not just the acronyms and the buzzwords, but really do you understand the value proposition of the company that you're working for and the group or the division within that company? What are you selling, right? Anybody can find a, a profile online. If you take one of the workshops here today, you'll learn how to do that if you don't know how to do it already. Um, and then how do you approach them? How do you get in contact with them? Do you get on the phone? Do you send them an email? Do you send them an email? What do you do, right? So you've got to be able to reach out to them. And once you do make contact, do you understand the value of the company and the crew? Because they're going to say, hey, look, I get 15 emails a day. I get 50 emails a day. I, obviously, I'm good at what I do. Why should I talk to you and spend time out of my day versus this other company over here that just emailed me five times too? So that's where it comes in. How do you ensure you get the top talent? It's a relative term, I agree. But if you think that person's good for your position, how do you get them in the building or get them on the phone with a hiring manager? And that's the learn skill part, whether it's learning it from any tool you're using, learning how to use a tool, learning how to work with a rep, work with your hiring manager, go to training, read a book, watch a video, come to a seminar, get very good at selling the opportunity that you're representing, right? And it can be an individual group too, it can be an individual department, some specific group within engineering. Come and work for this team and here's what you're gonna be able to do. I call it WIFT, what's in it for them? Right, what's in it for them? They get calls all day, right? So, okay. hope that helps. We have time for one more question. Does anybody have a question, or would you want me to? Quiet group. Okay, there we go. Go all ahead. All right, bring it, follow up. Uh, what are your top metrics that you track? You guys are at very different stages of a startup. Um, so what's important maybe at, you know, when you're a recruiting team of one versus four versus 25? All right, we'll start with Kat. You have 30 seconds each well, to answer. Go. This is really, <laughs> metrics are hard because I'm manually calculating metrics and because I also handle HR. Um, candidate referral or employee referrals is a, a big metric for us in terms of how I look at um, successfully building a hiring culture um, within the company. Um, how long someone stays in the pipeline is very important to me. Um, it speaks to candidate experience, and when you're this lean, you need to make sure that no one's staying in the pipeline for too long. It also means that you have a strong enough hiring culture that moves things along, even when you're you know, here on stage. Someone is back home making sure candidates are getting closed, and there are at least four offers about to go out today, and I'm stressed about it right now, but when you have, when you have the mechanisms in place and you've put the trust on, back on the executive team that you support, then things will happen. And when you enable them to be that advocate for you, you don't have to sell as hard because you have other people selling for you. All right, Jim, number one metric. Number one metric, so as a recruiting leader, I would say that my number one metrics I use is can't quantify it. I talk to the business and stay close to the business. They say, hey, Jennifer's doing a great job. Jennifer's doing a great job. If the, my client is happy, then that, that's number one for me. Because if you just measured it by hires, that's difficult, especially when you really are reaching for the top talent that's out there. And you, then you default. If you just did hires, that's simple, right? How many hires did you get? You did a great job, high five. Time to hire is important for me too. Not necessarily the 20.2 days, but if something gets over 60 days, it gets on my radar. I wanna know what's happening. Did we have 15 people come in, we presented five offers, and they all turned us down. Why are they turning us down? Why, you know, what happened to those 15 people? Did they have a bad candidate experience, right? I mean, so that, those are the numbers within the numbers that I look at. You can't just go by number of hires or number of submittals or number of on-site interviews because the type of people you guys might be looking for, 
they're so rare and so difficult to find that you're not going to get the traditional numbers that turn and burn through a normal cycle, right? So I don't really look at specific numbers per se, but my number one metrics I look at is the business happy with my team? And are they doing a good job? Are they happy with the quality of candidates they're seeing? Are they happy with the pipeline? And that's a tough thing to measure, but. Okay. Anthony? Yeah, I, I, I like Jim's comment. You know, data is important when you're having issues, right? So do you have that collection system to monitor data in the background while staying focused on what's important to you? So you know, for having first year recruiters that are absolutely kicking butt, you know, I want number of touches. Let's continue to work through the numbers game. And then let's see how we can move those people through process. Always push process. Move it as fast as you can. If you, you're not quite sure 100% what this person's going to do, and I think this is probably more related back to agency life, uh, if you're not 100% sure, get them to take the call with the hiring manager at your client. Get them in the door. Allow them to pick it up for you and, and take things from there. But provide that experience. Ask them the right questions. Be a great listener. Take good notes. Uh, those are important things. So top of the funnel is very important to us how quickly we're able to push process and get them on site. So those sort of conversions are pretty easily measured. And then, you know, are we, are we knocking out the wrecks that we have to do? But I agree with Jim, you know, data is going to be really vital when you're having issues. Not, not when you're up front, kicking butt, and ahead of your number. Uh, so just make sure you're able to capture them and measure them over time and, and know where you can go in and identify where the breaks are and fine tune things, uh, more so than one, one metric in particular. Great. Well, you guys have, uh, I've learned a lot myself. I hope you have as well. So I want to thank Kat, Jim, and Anthony for their answers today. And thank you. You guys have a great day.